Hello, and thank you for joining us at IMF 2020. My name is Laura McClure. I'm the Mount Maker at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, DC. Joining me today are co-hosts Elizabeth Soriano from the Getty, who will be running the content, Sam Hamilton from Art Center Melbourne, who will keep an eye on your questions, and Emmy Savakul, who is watching our social media channels. We gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. Please note your microphones will be muted and cameras turned off during the presentations. We are recording all the presentations to eventually post to the IMF YouTube channel. So we want the audio quality to be as good as possible. We are also live streaming on YouTube at the IMF's channel. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. If you have a question for a specific person, please use their name so they know it's directed to them. We will try to address as many questions as we can. And at the end of each presentation, any questions we can't get to during the Q&A can be brought up during our after parties or through the Slack app at hashtag day one early session. Also, feel free to contact the presenters directly. Each presenter's abstract and bio are on the IMF's website at mountmakersforum.net slash IMF 2020 day one. Today's program will be an excellent way to begin this year's virtual forum and I'm very excited to get you started by introducing you to our steering committee. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to IMF 2020. We made it. We're here. Yay. My name's Shelley Euler. I'm from the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and we are the IMF Steering Committee. My name is Mac Lowry from the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Welcome to IMF 2020. Richard Hartz from the Getty Villa in Los Angeles. Welcome to the IMF 2020. Hi, I'm Mayor Latouche. I'm David Latouche from Westmont, New Jersey. Welcome to, to the IMF, IMF 2020. 2020. Hi, I'm BJ Farrar. I'm with the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and welcome to the IMF 2020. I'm Jamie Haskell from Seattle. Welcome to IMF 2020. I'm Elizabeth Soriano uh, from the Getty, and welcome to the IMF 2020. I'm Laura McClure. I'm from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Welcome to IMF 2020. Hi, I'm Pam Gable from Field Museum in Chicago. Welcome to IMF 2020. And I'm Earl Locke, also in Chicago area. And everybody, welcome to the forum. Hi, I'm Samantha Hamilton from Art Centre Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to IMF 2020. Pierre-Luc Brouillette uh, du Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec. Et welcome to the IMF 2020. I'm Emmy Savakul, coming to you from Philadelphia, PA. Welcome to IMF 2020. Hi, I'm Sam Gatley with Te Papa in New Zealand. Welcome to the IMF 2020. Um, hi, I'm Philip Bretz from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, welcome to the IMF 2020. Hello, everyone. My name is Shelley Euler. On behalf of the IMF Steering Committee, I want to welcome all of you to IMF 2020. So I assume that everybody here already knows what mount making is, right? If you don't already know, you definitely will at the end of these four days. <laughs> but have you ever wondered exactly who or what the IMF is? No, we aren't that little monetary fund organization. But we are the International Mountmakers Forum. 
which is an international group of private and institutional allied professionals dedicated to the advancement and the creative work of making safe and well-made exhibition and storage months. By being here this week, you are all part of the IMF. The International Mount Makers Forum is an organization that exists to support the work of the mount making community. It is committed to fostering communication, promoting best practices, and disseminating current information regarding materials, tools, techniques, and solutions for object storage and display. One of our main goals is to organize this biennial conference to give us a place to gather and exchange experience and ideas. But did you know that we also have a website, mountmakersforum.net? Because many of you registered uh, for this conference through the site, you do know about it, but not everybody does. We think of the website as an extension of this conference where you can find links to our online forum, links to past conferences, lists of mount making related articles and books, workshops and seminars, materials, info, and some tools. In the last few years, we've also expanded into social media more, especially Instagram and a little bit of Facebook. And in this conference, we are experimenting with Slack as a place to keep conversations going beyond this week. As you can see from our welcome video, the IMF Steering Committee is made up of mount makers and colleagues from allied professions all over the world. We are all volunteers, loosely connected by our love for the profession, a deep respect for the cultures and artists and natural history that we are privileged to work with, and for some, a more than mild obsession with tools. Many of the steering committee members have been hosts of past forums, but some are just interested in helping to make this conference the best it can be. We're always open to new members, so please contact us if you'd like to join us. Along with everybody else during this crazy time, this new normal forced the IMF to approach things differently. Just one institution would take on the organization of the event with support from the committee. This year, we were faced with going virtual or not gathering at all. And I would say, pandemic aside, I'd argue that this shift turned out to be a fabulous thing. I mean, we're a bunch of problem solvers who love a challenge, and this was definitely a challenge. Instead of one institution taking on the lion's share of the work, we were able to pull together across the globe to draw on the different strengths and experiences of our members. And we were able to welcome so many more of you from every continent and time zone on the planet, over 800 people and counting, to come together in this, these unusual times to exchange information about mount making in this new way. We're so happy that you have joined us for this experiment this week and hope that you will continue with us in the future. Thank you so much for being here. On behalf of the IMF Steering Committee, welcome to IMF 2020. That was amazing. I'd like to now introduce Duane Blue Spruce from my sister museum, the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in New York City. Greetings from New York City. My name is Duane Blue Spruce, and I'm an architect and project manager at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian in New York. I've worked at the NMAI since 1993. I spent 12 years in DC and have been in New York since 2005. The NMAI in DC hosted the second International Mount Makers Forum back in 2010. So the museum has been a strong supporter of the forum for at least a decade. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the seventh International Mount Makers Forum. Given the large number of people at this forum, you might consider adding a few bands, selling some merch and changing the name to something like Mount Apalooza. I've been told that there are participants from over 35 countries and all the continents. With that kind of global representation, it almost feels like we should all be marching into an Olympic stadium, carrying flags, and ending with a carefully orchestrated acetylene torch lighting ceremony. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person, but I'm glad that we could get together in this way. It's exciting that so many of you are participating from so many different places and institutions. 
By sharing your expertise and experiences with one another, I'm confident that the con conversations this week will both enlighten and inspire everyone. As a project manager on two very high profile exhibit projects at the NMAI, I am keenly aware of the value that mountain makers bring to a project. Infinity of Nations was a 700 object survey exhibit of NMAI's vast collection. Because our collection is hemispheric in scope, the objects and their mounts were incredibly diverse. Glittering World was an exhibit of exquisite historic and contemporary Navajo jewelry. The level of detail in making over 400 mounts for necklaces, earrings, belts, bracelets, and rings was extraordinary. While there are many players on a given project, it is the conservators, collection staff, and mount makers who have the most hands-on relationship with the objects. I marvel at the skill and discipline it takes to make a mount that displays an invaluable object to its best advantage to the viewer. Mount making is a wonderful mix of artistry and craftsmanship. Your work, coupled with proper lighting, is what really makes the objects sing. The irony is that if you do your job well, your work will largely go unnoticed. I want to thank the IMF Steering Committee and the institutions that you represent for organizing the forum. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers behind the scenes who are working their magic to make this happen. I'm sure it was not an easy task with everyone working remotely. Finally, I want to thank NMAI's own Shelly Euler for her support of the forum and for asking me to be a small part of it. For museums and other cultural institutions, there is nothing more valuable to us than the objects in our collections and the people those objects represent. We come together this week in the spirit of stewardship and collaboration. My hope is that these four days will spark new ideas and new relationships while encouraging ongoing conversations and continued collaboration. Thank you all for participating. Enjoy the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. I love the idea of Mountapalooza. Uh, we would be the headlining acts and it would definitely be Metallica. That's your mount making joke for right now. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, our first presentation. Please welcome Leanne Smith of the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, United Kingdom. She will be presenting Mount Making for Display and Conservation, a case study. Hello, my name is Leanne Smith and I'm the Conservation Collections Care Technician at the Whitworth Park Gallery of the University of Manchester. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, it's a real honour to be part of the 7th International Mount Makers Forum. Um, before I get started, I am just going to close my um, video panel just so that you'll be able to see the slides a little bit better. Today, I'm gonna to be talking you through a mounting system created for Tadic Butelik's reflection of the moon, a complex and fragile piece of woven art created in 1977. This talk will discuss the challenges we have to overcome when working with an exceptionally fragile object and demonstrate how a new mount system was devised that would not only allow the piece to be displayed upright for sustained periods, but also enable easier access and storage. Considerations such as reduced handling and mount making not only for display, but for long-term preventative conservation will also be discussed. So to start with, I'll tell you a little bit about why the work was undertaken. In 2019, Reflection of the Moon was chosen to be displayed as part of the Two Temple Place exhibition, Unbound, Visionary Women Collecting Textiles. The exhibition celebrated seven pioneering women who were bringing together textiles at a time when they were mostly seen as purely functional. These visionary women defied the traditional concept of collecting and forged the way for textiles, revealing their extraordinary artistic, social and cultural importance, showing the world that they were crucial documents of social history, as well as works of art in their own right. 
One of the celebrated women was Dr Jennifer Harris, curator of textiles and deputy director of the Whitworth Art Gallery between 1982 and 2016. Responsible for building a collection of art textiles of global significance, Harris's arrival at the gallery coincided with a craft revival and the development of textiles as a conceptual art form. Her collection at the Whitworth was influential in shaping thinking around textiles. And as a curator, she worked with artists in exhibiting, commissioning and purchasing work that explored the contested territories of textiles and art, as well as exploring issues of textiles and gender. The respect with which she is held is reflected in the number of works donated to the Whitworth by leading artists, including Tadit Butlick. Once described as Britain's greatest artist in fibre, Polish-born Butlick was an innovator in the treatment of yarn and weaving techniques, moving from flat weave tapestries towards experimental sculptural forms what he called free warp tapestries. Although he is somewhat out of fashion, his work represents an important phase in textile art and was therefore chosen to be part of the Unbound exhibition. Having not been on display since being acquired in 1999, the condition of the of reflection of the moon first needed to be assessed. Made from organic materials, including esperato grass, sisal and jute, the work is exceptionally fragile and prone to shedding. The original display system, as you can see here, consisted of a metal rod with polyester hanging ties. After consultation with our textiles conservator and French, this was deemed insufficient and inappropriate for even short term display and damaging to the work itself, providing inadequate support. Therefore, a new map was needed. Due to the extremely fragile nature of the work, we decided that the new system had to be created that not only reduced handling, but also combined display and long term conservation of the object. So with this in mind, a system was devised with the intention that the work would remain permanently in the mount. When designing the new mount, the following factors were taken into consideration. Working with an exceptionally fragile material, ensuring the reduction of object handling, the ability to suspend the work upright without damage, accounting for the three-dimensional element of the work whilst ensuring it lays flat, the ability to access the work in its mount, using reversible mounting techniques that avoid damaging the work, and the long-term conservation of the object. So after many discussions between myself and our textiles conservator, work on the mount began. As you can see here, the back of the work features a series of tied ends. In order for the work to sit flat, a supportive mount needed to be made into which the ties could slot. After ruling out metal and perspex supports, we quickly decided that plastizo would be the most suitable material, as it could be carved to the correct shape and provide a flat and stable surface. The first step was to get an accurate placement of the ties on the reverse of the work. However, due to the three dimensional nature of the work, it wasn't possible to lay it on its front without causing significant damage. So a pair of trestle tables were set up onto which a piece of perspex with melanex attached to the back was laid. This enabled the reverse of the work to be viewed from underneath without having to turn it over. And an outline of the back of the work was then drawn onto the melanex and from this a paper pattern was created that also allowed for the space needed around the work. 
piece of plaster zoat was then chosen with a depth that accommodated the length of the ties, ensuring no fibres would be crushed. Using the pattern, the plaster zoat was cut to size and carved into shape. In order to create a smooth surface, the whole piece was covered in Tyvek, including the inner sections. To give a professional finish and disguise the underpinnings, mount board was cut to sit around the work and on top of the plaster zone. Wanting to achieve the, I'm not really here, look all mount makers aspire to, this was covered in unbleached calico, providing a neutral background that did not distract from the work. The calico was secured on the reverse using a glue gun and Tyvek tape, ensuring a neat finish around the edges. Excess fabric was left around the outer edges as this would be stretched to cover the entire mount. So, although the plaster zone mount would help support the piece, it would not keep it upright. Working closely with our textiles conservator, a minimally intrusive system was devised that enabled the work to be secured to the mount. Using polyester button thread, strips of co cotton twill tape were carefully stitched to the work across the top and bottom, both vertically and horizontally, leaving excess tabs. All stitching was done across the warp threads, ensuring no fibres were split. The warp is the continuous thread that runs the length of the weave. Subjected to greater stress, it is usually stronger than the horizontal weft. In this case, the warp consisted of a strong polyester cord, as you can see here. Therefore, it was necessary that all stitching was carried out across the warp to ensure the weight was taken by the strongest element of the weave. A staggered zigzag stitch was, left, was used along the warp, whereas several rows of running stitch were used along the weft. Using this technique meant that if in the future the work needed to be removed from the mount, everything was easily reversible and wouldn't cause any damage. To provide extra stability and a surface onto which the cotton tape and calico could be secured, an MDF board was cut to sit underneath the plaster zone. The MDF was coated with an acrylic lacquer, Zachary, and covered in moist up. The moist up was ironed in place across the front and sides, providing an inert layer which prevents any off-gassing from the MDF penetrating the work. Tyvek tape was then used along the edges to disguise the darker colouring of the moist up. So now it was time to assemble the mount. In order for the object to remain face up and flat at all times, this section of the assembly was done on a large stitching table, supported by two trestles. This allowed work to be carried out underneath the mount and reduced unnecessary handling. The MDF backboard was placed on the trestle table first, with the moist up facing upwards. Then the shaped plasters out with the calico covered mount on top allowing the excess fabric to hang over the sides. Next, the work was carefully positioned in place, ensuring it lay perfectly flat and central with the cotton tape tabs positioned underneath the calico and coward mount. The cotton tabs were then tightly stretched over the plaster zone and MDF before being secured in place by stapling them to the underside of the MDF backboard. The excess calico was then stretched over all layers towards the back and stapled to the MDF. In order to create the tightness needed and keep the grain of the fabric straight, the calico was pinned to the plaster soap first and then masking tape was used to position it onto the backboard when, before stapling everything in place. All corners were neatly folded in to create, all corners were neatly folded in to create a smooth finish. As you can see here, the work is sitting nice and flat and is firmly secured in its new mount.
Now the support system had been made, the final step was to enable the work to be wall mounted. A wooden frame and perspex lid were created to accommodate the dimensions of the mounted work. Finally, the mount was fixed in place on the wooden frame and the lid secured on top. The addition of the perspex lid was essential for open display and storage as it would protect the work from being touched or accidentally knocked. Here you can see the work safely hanging in the Whitworth collection stores. Reflection of the moon was an exceptionally interesting piece to work on with many complex issues to accommodate. Being constructed from such brittle and fragile materials prior to mounting, every single touch risks further shedding. Now the work is much more secure with the mount system allowing the work to both be, to both be safe, safely displayed and stored with no need to handle the object itself. The issue of shedding has now been significantly reduced as the enclosed mount not only protects it from human contact but also environmental factors. I think you'll agree that this is a great example of how mount making can not only serve as a way to display an object, but also enable its long term conservation care. The work is now much more accessible, meaning it's more likely to be chosen for exhibition, as well as more easily viewed by members of the public who visit our collection. After 22 years in the Whitworth stores, it was amazing to finally see this fascinating piece of woven art on display at Two Temple Place. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Leanne. We now have time to answer any questions that our attendees may have for you. Our Q&A facilitator is Sam Hamilton. And I actually have a question for Leanne. Leanne, I've never used Plastizote. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and how do you use it? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, Plastizote is basically a kind of foam, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes in different um, densities. Mm -hmm. So we, for this particular amount, we use quite a dense um, plastic coat just to keep the weight and obviously keep it sturdy um, but it's great to use for loads of different things we've used it quite a few times in the Whitworth for textiles mounting in particular because um, it's you know you can pin into it it gives that flexibility so when working with fabric it's really good to be able to stretch fabric open be able to pin it in um, mm -hmm. and like I say it like with this mount, we carved into it as well. Um, sometimes <laughs> carving into it is a, is a challenge to get the desired uh, shape, but um, you sort of start to develop a knack for it. But um, yeah, right. it's a really, really versatile um, material to use. Is it like carving um, like foam? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, so that can be tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it can... Um, it can be cut on machines as well, but obviously okay. with this, because it was such a particular shape that was needed, um, yeah. it was all cut out by hand. It's a brilliant mount. Um, and I know a lot of mount makers deal with the issue of, of objects not, you, you know, where, how do you work on an object <laughs> and not squish it or yeah. cause any damage? Yeah, this was um, a very, very interesting piece to work on because it was so, so fragile. Honestly, like every time, you know, you tried to move it, you had to be so careful because it was just, it would, it would break. Right. Um, so yeah, it obviously, uh. I know, I know. <laughs> so sort of being set the challenge um, was, um, yeah, interesting and sort of, yeah, working out how to do it. So I, I, I'm afraid I did spend quite a lot of time um, shuffling around on the floor underneath it, but um, yes, <laughs> it was fun though. It was a great project. So Leanne, we've got some other questions for you. Um, th there's one that says, was the chosen depth of the case engineered to, re to reduce the electro electrostatic pull on the fibres? Um, good question. Um, I think for us, it was more about um, sort of trying to get it so it wasn't, yeah, going to come into contact at any point with the work itself. Um, and that was sort of 
you know, this wasn't a project that I did solely on my own. Um, the perspex and the wooden frame was done by one of our other technicians at the gallery. Um, so he sort of worked around with the perspex. So if there are any particular questions about that, I can always um, ask my colleague and get back to people about that. Wonderful. Thank you. And there's another one around the MDF. Um, somebody's asked, was the N MDF sealed or why wasn't yeah. it perhaps sealed? Yeah, so um, the MDF was um, basically coated on all sides with an acrylic lacquer. Um, and then the moist up was used on the bit that was, was in contact essentially with the work. So the back of the board wasn't covered with the moist up, but that was because that was that wasn't near the work in any way. Like there were several layers sort of in between that, so. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question that, um, what was the lead time and how long did it take to complete? Um, so I think we had maybe three or four months. Um, it's a while ago now, so I can't specifically remember. Um, but it took, it took a good sort of, month and a half maybe sort of working on that and maybe working on some of the projects at the same time so it was a luckily we had enough time and warning to be able to go back and forth with that thank you um another question is how were the cotton somebody's uh might might have missed a bit of the detail but can you just please explain again the cotton tape and the stitching on the back of the artwork um and how that was done and and made invisible so um, the work itself, um, so the the warp of the work was actually a sort of maybe two, three mil um, polyester thread. Um, so and be, because it was the warp, that is the more load bearing um, sort of piece of the work. Um, so what we did is we used cotton tape. Um, and as you'll have seen at the back of the work, it had the ties. So it did, um, it was difficult because you only have a certain amount of area that you could actually stitch into. So at the top and the bottom, there are both vertical and horizontal tabs um, that were stitched on. Um, and this was done with a button, polyester button thread and very, very carefully, because again, like I said, it was a very fra fragile piece of work. Um, we had to hand stitch um, across the warp making sure that we didn't sort of break any fibres as we were doing it. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions related to the perspex. Um, so one is, is, is it actually removable? Um, and so, in, you know, in the, in the case that the, the fibres shed and that you'd need to actually remove them from the case. And then also, um, was, how was it stored after the exhibition? And, and you know, did you, did you keep the perspex on top to protect the ob obverse? Yeah, so um, yes, the, the perspex is removable. Um, the whole mount itself was designed so that the work stayed in the mount um, because of the issues of storage. Um, so when it was all finished um, on, sort of, I think the second to last slide, um, the picture that you see there is our stores. So it has um, like a hook system essentially on the back. Um, so it will remain upright at all times, but yes, if um, there is any sort of excess shedding that um, distracts from the work itself, then the perspex can be removed to deal with that. Fantastic. Um, there's another question here around the Tyvek and can you, act, you know, actually explain a little bit more about how you clearly um, finished that one and, and around those interior cur curves particularly? Yeah. So um, the Tyvek was used because uh, when carving out plaster, so especially when doing it by hand, um, it's hard to get a really, really smooth finish. Um, so the Tyvek was there to sort of get rid of any um, sort of sticking out bits, essentially. Um, so what happened was, so there was sort of three shapes to work around. Um, and around each shape, sort of about an inch um, around, I cut sort of holes, like, you know, little stabs uh, with the knife, which then enabled me to actually tuck the Tyvek in. Um, so there was the piece for the main part of the mount, and then there was separate pieces used for the inner sections. So working around in. So 
it's kind of hard to see on the on the picture, but it is like separate pieces of Tyvek that have then been tucked in. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question asking oh, about. Sam, sorry, we've Sam, yeah, we're out of time for. We're questions. out. Sorry, my time is on. The I end know end. there's no Laura. <laughs> I'm in Australia. <laughs> I assume you're just playing with koala bears. That's what's, what's going on right now. Leanne, that was okay. amazing. And um, and if if anyone has questions for Leanne or you you were feeling shy, um, you can find Leanne's email address in the chat. Um, but we're gonna move on to our next presentation. We're just getting started, people. Our next presenters are Andrew Estep of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and Jody Hansen, a freelance mount maker in Buffalo, New York. They will be presenting Nowhere to Hide, Seamless Mounting on a Plexiglass Panel. Nowhere to hide, seamless mounting on a plexiglass panel. Hello, I am Andy Estep. I'm an assistant conservation preparator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'll be co-presenting today with Jody Hansen, an independent mount maker who was a contractor on the British Gallery Project. One of the many goals of mount making in a museum context is to prioritize the viewing of the art. Our work must be as unobtrusive as possible. This presentation discusses the heightened challenges we faced when the exhibit curator and the designer wanted the artwork to appear to be suspended in midair. The proposal for this project was that many small objects would be arranged in groups and displayed on both sides of four eight foot high by two foot wide by inch and a quarter thick clear frameless plexiglass panels. In this massed out grouping, these small objects would gain a much larger presence. The retail case is a focal point in the center of one of the rooms in the renovated British gallery at the Met, and it is viewable from any angle. It contains approximately 130 small objects that are representative of the period of the rise of the middle class in Britain. These are displayed on individual brass mounts that are grouped by type. Consideration had to be paid to what is visible through the plexiglass, so both sides must be carefully planned. The effect of, of this display is that the artifacts appear to be floating like jewels in space and yet viewed from across the room, it creates an impressively large visual impact. The curatorial and design process started by reviewing the objects and then proceeded to scaled paper mock-ups. Mylar was used to visualize both sides of each panel. Paper mock-ups certainly are a common place to begin. When changes can quickly be made, objects removed and switched around. Consideration of sight lines and object heights are easily reviewed. But flat paper cannot effectively replace the dimensional considerations of depth and post lengths, which is essential information to the mount maker. The importance of a full 3D mock-up cannot be dismissed. This part of the curatorial and design process allows for full review of the interplay of the panels and sides all together. If you have a project like this, many will ask why this is so vital to the success of the display. Cost of materials such as plexi and space are both arguments against this step. Some people will push for wood panels instead of plexi, again due to cost and availability. Fortunately, we'd had a recent project at the Met in our renovated musical instruments galleries. Having known the needs of that project, we clearly knew the best approach for this work and the institutional precedent for this course of action had been set. 
In the 3D mock-up, both sides can be considered in order to evaluate the relationship of the objects, the totality of the density, and rhythmic impact. Final determination of post length, object depth, and placement are refined in this phase of the project. With the initial planning finalized, we had a selection of objects that the curator and designer agreed were pieces we would use. Once we knew the angles to hold each object, we commenced making the actual mounts. We decided to limit the number of post diameters for the sake of uniformity. Too much variety among so many objects would look confusing. Because these objects would be fully seen in the round, the curators wanted the mounts to be carefully painted out for viewing as well. Here are a few examples. All object mounts were initially made with posts of generous length that we could later cut back to size. The cases for the British Gallery were fabricated in Italy, which meant that there was a long lead time between planning and final installation. Also, getting samples of the surfaces, as well as the final use plexiglass, took a long time. So very thorough planning was necessary throughout the whole process. Knowing about these long lag times, and that this is still a relatively new display technique for our team, we decided to make a full-sized mock-up using the completed mounts and plexiglass panels of half thickness. In this mock-up, the holes would go past the entire way through the plexiglass, so we could use those long post lengths to move the, the objects forward and backward to determine how, how they would fit in space. Using plexiglass in this mock-up was helpful to the exhibit designer and curator because they could solve some unanticipated issues earlier in the process and save time and cost in the final installation. Making these mock-ups brought up practical questions such as, should the holes pass all the way through the plexiglass or not? If not, what about the ends of the drill bits themselves? The angle of plexiglass drill bit tips are very pointed versus regular bits, and they will show in the plexiglass. As you can see here, the drilled holes in the plexiglass have a gray color that has a strong visual presence to the viewer. Because it was unavoidable, we chose to embrace the gray drilled hole color and painted the post mounts that gray. The panel edges were another thing that we could work with through the mock-up. At first, we tried polished edges on the panels and the light refracted and reflected the hole drill holes to the point of distraction. Instead, we went with a frosted edge that does not reflect, but does add a glowing visual frame around each panel. To get the post color to match as close as possible to the whole color, we used the Object Conservation Department's adjustable portable light fixtures that can adjust color temperature and brightness along with the lighting department's gallery fixture lighting plan to match the stem color to the drill out color so it would be as close a match as possible in the final installation. The full size mock-up with half thickness plexi ended up being very useful for the design and curation team and for us as well. We were able to work out several anticipated and unanticipated issues before the final installation. Also at this point, all of the objects and mounts could be moved forward and backward from the panels using those long stems. So the curators could really see the groupings and make their final adjustments. Since in the end, all holes will be visible, we really needed to do as many adjustments as possible with this mock-up before working on the final display, where we will be very limited in our ability to make any changes.
After all object positions were finalized, each mount post was marked for length and a session number. If an object was moved during the mock-up review, it was important to indicate clearly the new hole and X out the unused hole. After removing all the mounts from the panels, then a full sheet of mylar was layered onto the plexi. With a Sharpie, the holes were carefully marked and important notations were made on the mylar templates, which now served as our drill pattern. There were eight drill templates, one for each side. Clinical condition, plexi anxiety. To me, plexi equals sleeplessness. Once or twice in the days leading up to the date. You might rationalize it, like you might say to yourself, this is just like fabric. No, it's really not like fabric, which has its own host of pitfalls. But the best course of action that we can share with you when we were successful is practice. Take your time. Double check everything. Template location, drill bit size, check it twice. Allow your bits to cool and do not stop drilling. Once you start drilling and you're in the plexi, do not stop until that bit is out of the plexi. Because the exhibit design was mount posts emerging from the plexi in a pressure fit format, the sizing of our holes was very important. As you may know, plexiglass has a tendency to melt slightly during drilling, and the holes can become oversized or a melted mess. I've used many different drill guides over the years, the kind that attached to the screw gun with a spring action, holes in a heavy metal plate. I never really trust them. They're okay. Levels mounted to screw guns, forget about it. I feel like my post drilling life changed forever after using these retrofitted tabletop drill presses. It's a simple pleasure. We could achieve very controlled straight holes. Using fresh drill bits and silicone lubricant was our best approach to clean holes without melting or bit chatter. In some cases, we also used metric sized bits. For example, a quarter inch rod in theory measures 0.25, right? But in reality, it might be slightly fatter or thinner in diameter. By using metric bits, you can slip between the wire size drill bit sizes of 15 64ths and 17 64ths. This allows for a very customized fit. At the Met, we have several mount makers sharing the studio at the same time. Often we bounce problem solving ideas off of each other. This is the modified tabletop drill press Jody just mentioned. This modification was a great brainstorm by another mount maker, conservation preparator Matthew Cumby. This modification entailed making a large hole in the aluminum base plate of the drill that could accommodate the drill chuck and moving the whole motor housing down the pedestal because now all of the hole drilling would happen below the original base plate. Then the base plate was carefully padded to avoid potentially scratching the plexiglass. In fact, as you see here, we made a second one with a wooden base that required much less permanent alteration. All drilling into the final plexiglass panels was done with the panel laid flat and fully supported underneath to avoid stress on the plexiglass. We laid out each sheet of mylar on the plexiglass, taking care to align it properly and make sure that when the time came to flip the panel, the one side corresponded to the other side of the same panel. When drilling, we left the protective plastic on the panel to avoid any possible scratching. With all this talk about the 3D mock-up, there's not all that much to say about the installation, rather formulaic and uneventful until the big reveal, which only underscores how fantastic it is to work in a mode of methodical pre-planning. Nothing was left to chance during the installation. It was merely a matter of inserting the mounts into the pre-drilled holes, using care to ensure that they were snug and did not get bent during installation. That part had all the creativity of a paint-by-number, 
which allowed us to focus solely on proper fit and safety of the objects. It was a great balance of priorities. In consultation with the Met's plexiglass fabrication department, it was decided that any cleaning would be kept to an absolute minimum. The cast panels have a softness and zeal in cleaning could lead to a noticeable scratch. I judiciously used a long-handled, very soft paintbrush to remove only the most noticeable dust particles. It was a beautiful design to have each side fully viewable with a seamless glass panel. That large glass door rested on a rail system with wheels and could be slid open to reveal 60% of the side for installation purposes. In order to maintain the integrity of the case, only one side was opened at a time. The door was supported by a suction cup prop that was supplied by the fabricator. This project involved extensive planning and we feel that the many steps we went through were necessary with constant review to achieve a result that was exactly what the curator envisioned. The British Gallery exhibit and the retail case opened only two weeks before both the museum and the city closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we were able to see the people enjoying the display during the gallery opening and in the short time it was on display to the public. We were happy to say that both the Met and the exhibit reopened August 29th, so people can again see this display. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew and Jody. We now have time to answer any questions that our attendees may have for you. And actually, sorry, I have a question as well. <laughs> Um, were the stems that you used, were they steel or brass? We just used brass. Brass. It's the best. <laughs> um, I also very much appreciated your plexi anxiety <laughs> slide. Um, anyone who's worked with plexi has had all of those sadnesses and anxieties. Right. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I've got some questions for you as well. How did you work out possible shadows from gallery lighting to mock up the stage um, of, of, in your planning? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry, it's just jumped out of my screen. Um, how did you work out possible shadows from gallery lighting during your mock up? The, the, the shadows were kind of impossible to uh, to plan for uh, with the, the way that we had made the, the full size mock-up. We didn't have exact positioning of the lights. So we didn't, we couldn't mock up the positioning of the lights in the mock-up. Uh, we, we used the plan, but not, not the, uh, like we couldn't mock up the lighting as well. Okay, right, great. but it, it, I don't think it became an issue. I mean, with the, the plane of the objects and how far they were off the, the plexi, I don't really feel that we had any really problematic shadows um, in the final result. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about those stems and how they attach to the objects and then also go back to how they were attached to the plexi as well? The they're attached to the objects like a like a regular spider mount would be on a on an object. They kind of wrap around and, and clasp the different objects in different ways according to the the way that the object dictates. And then the the actual going into the um, plexiglass is just a press fit. Great, thank you. There's a question about working with the curators and did you sort of have to um, draw a line as to when they could um, stop changing their mind? <laughs> you know, we had a great relationship with our curators um, during this process. There were some curators that came and went throughout this very long British Galleries project that was many, many years. Um, but I think by the time we got to the, the point that we were drilling, um, you know, it had been, it had been flushed out so many times 
that, um, you know, everybody seemed to understand what it was going to look like. And there were a few changes just in sort of how the, the clusters related to each other. But, um, but it was, it, it, it went really smoothly. Fantastic. There's some questions here around the paints. Can you talk to us a little bit about what paints you used on the, on the mounts? Um, and then did they scratch? You know, was there any problems with scratching as you were actually installing and working with them? We just, um, we used latex paint on the stems and then acrylic paint on the, on the objects. Um, any, any scratching uh, was minimal, uh, but we could also go back and, and touch them up. Um, the, the way that the plexiglass is distorted when you drill in, into the plexiglass, um, you can't really see um, any scratches inside the hole. Um, it's, it's invisible. Right, and also because we cut them, um, I had put all these posts in and then I looked from the other side and all I could see was this like shiny brass end. And so I, I sent a picture to the curator who was actually in London, I think then. And I said, I know it's a really small detail, but I think it probably matters. And let's, you know, so I had to take every single post back out, dab the little teeny end and, um, and then put them back in. And, and it was well worth the effort. Excellent. Can you talk to us a little bit about the display case um, and, and how did you find working with it? The, the case was made by Gopien um, in Italy. Um, the, it's a very high tech thing. Um, a lot of our planning, most of the planning, most of the actual mount building was done before the case was finished. So um, we had to, deal with it mostly in the abstract. <laughs> and then uh, in final installation, uh, it was kind of a surprise what, what it actually fit like. And I mean, we knew in theory what it would be like, but not, not the reality until it, until it showed up. Thank you. Um, there's a question here that says, um, given that you knew the whole placement in advance, did you consider using CNC machine to drill them? We don't have a CNC, so no. <laughs> okay. Um, and what about um, consideration of stainless steel rods? Was there a consideration of using different materials? None of the objects were, were actually heavy enough to require a stainless steel rod. Um, they were all, they looked, large but they're actually miniatures like uh, the largest piece was maybe a, a foot um nothing nothing very heavy okay great there's a question here about did you try other lubricants for drilling and if yes. so yes and, and so yeah. if you can talk to us a little bit about that in your choice in the end yeah um so i tried brilliant eyes as well I tried just water. These are things that people had suggested to me. Um, and also just, you know, like an oil, right? So like you would typically drill with an oil. Um, but I was worried about um, the oil um, sort of changing color or um, the, the silicone is clear and um, it just responded to the heat of the drill bit um, and was just, a, just provided a little bit of assistance. The brilliant eyes and the, the water, those weren't really all that helpful. Okay, thank you. But if people have uh, other suggestions, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears for what people might use for Plexi. There's um, some questions here around installation and people wanting to know, um, were you firstly installing the mounts um, and then after the plexi was installed vertically? Um, so if you can talk a little bit about the installation, that would be great. Well, the plexi was installed first and it was uh, spaced and secured and made plumb. And then all of the individual mount posts went in and then the objects went in after that. So is that the answer to the question? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And then um, were there any objects that weren't selected because of the display method? 
Well, there were a few that were changed. Sorry, Andy. There were changes, yes. Yeah, there were changes. No, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah, there were changes. There were some mounts we made that didn't get used, but you know, that happens. I mean, it wasn't a lot of pieces, fortunately. Thank you. Um, And people are asking, can you talk a little bit more about cleaning the acrylic after the drilling? Um, Well, when we drilled in the shop, um, every post was was checked to make sure that it fit Um, because I did not want to be inside the display case having to drill again because I didn't want any of that dust in there. Um, So we, we checked everything in advance uh, before we went into the, the case, um, the, the covering stayed on the plexi. Um, it wasn't paper. They tend to use plastic, maybe wherever this came from, Italy. Um, and so that all stayed on the plexi to keep it as clean until the very, very last minute. And then um, as I started to uh, try to clean up a couple little spots, that had a little fogging that was just part of the manufacturing, that's when I consulted with our plexi shop and decided just to really not address those uh, unless they were seemed really significant um, and just keep a really minimal approach to um, any cleaning. Great, thank you. Um, and one final question, if we can an- answer this one quickly, can you describe your technique for pressure fitting mounts into the plexi? What tools did you use and how did you avoid distorting the mounts? Um, if we, again, we tried to make them as close as possible in the drilling, but then I used monofilament um, when I needed it to be a little bit tighter uh, just to, to snug up those holes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you for answering all of those questions. And um, Jody, I did want to tell you that I've used Brilliant Eyes um, and Plex when I'm using a plastic stem. And I don't know, maybe it's just like because it's all plastic together that they get along really well. That's just my two cents. Thanks. <laughs> Um, So now it's time to move on to our next presentation, or as they say in Quebec, la presentation. That's a hint that Pierre-Luc Brulé of the Musée National du Beau-Art de Quebec will be presenting Telescopic Slide, a wall mount system for presenting light and fragile objects. Hello everyone, my name is Pierre-Luc Brouillette, technician in museology au Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec. Today I'll talk about a wall mounting system uh, we designed here at the museum uh, that I call telescopic slides. The first use we made of this system was to present daguerreotypes uh, in, the exhibi- in the permanent exhibition 350 years of artistical practice in Quebec. The challenge in this exhibition was of finding a safe and simple way to install daguerreotype in a wall mount presentation. Owing to their fragility, daguerreotypes can only be displayed uh, for a limited amount of time. Annual rotation of the contents of the the showcase is required. So we needed to design a reusable mounting system that make it possible to install new daguerreotype of similar format when the works are rotated. In In our display, we have four different formats of daguerreotypes. The first step was to choose a safe opening angle for all the daguerreotypes. With the conservator, we, we had to work with the most fragile one and see 
at which point we can open the daguerreotype to make a nice presentation and to respect the conservation of the object. After that, I made an adjustable jig with Etherfoam and Tyvek uh, to, to lay the daguerreotype face down in place. Using this jig, uh, I can make sure that all the daguerreotypes have the same opening angle. structure consisting of rectangular tube constitute the backbone of the mount. These tubes are welded with silver soldering on a flat strip. Adjustable section fits into the rectangular tubes. The part of the clip that is inserted into the tube is folded which follow the resistance of the slide to be controlled. Permanent solder and joint for the bottom retainers would be an option. However, for this relatively lightweight object, the tight pressure fit that could be created by crimping the end of the retainer legs that slip into the square brass rod base provide a sufficiently strong anchoring mechanism that fully supported the weight and thus produced a full adjustable mount. After a clear coating of all brass surface, all parts of the mount in contact with the daguerreotypes were padded with thin strip of black cross linked polyethylene foam or volara. For easy and safe installation, the four upper clips have less resistance than the four lower ones which support the weight of the object. The sliding system makes it possible to position the clips of the mount according to the natural fold of the hinge of the daguerreotypes, which tend to weaken. No set screws are required for the installation as friction and gravity secure the object in the mount. In this series of work, we had the challenge to mount a daguerreotype in horizontal position. A custom triangular padding made of etafoam covered with velara was made to lower the pressure on the hinge, smoothly supporting the upper part of the object. The telescopic slide system having proved its worth with daguerreotype, we decided to apply it to the presentation of miniature paintings on display in the same exhibition. The hanging rings of these paintings were too weak to be used for the installation. A Dartek layer is temporarily placed between the weak hanging system and the frame to avoid friction during the object preparation and transport. The curator asked it to find a discreet way to have the ring look straight. Once the miniature mount is in place on the ring, the Dartek layer is smoothly removed. These mounts were so small that it wasn't possible to add padding on it. So I sprayed several layers of Krylon clear coating on it to create a barrier between the ring and the mount. Here is a miniature tondo frame. In this case, three arms were enough to safely hold the object. The miniature mount to hold the ring is soldered to the part to the upper clip. All the clips of this mount are removable, so we can reuse the same structure if we have another round-shaped object at the next rotation. Here are the smallest mounts that I had to make for the presentation of this group of work. 
two old Menayans with very distinct features. Their rings being different from the previous miniatures, I had to create two new distinctive designs for the miniature mounts that hold them in place. Medallion as a particular feature that we absolutely want to show on display. There is a braiding hair at the back of the pictorial surface. The mount I have to make should not hide anything from these two surfaces, of course by holding the object firmly in place. We also added a mirror to show the back of the object. Once the daguerreotypes and miniature mounts have been complete, we are at the installation step. A reusable transport cabaret with pin edit of home block was made to safely transport the object through the museum to the gallery. The leeway provided by the telescopic slides was very useful in order to arrive at a positioning easy and precise with minimal manipulation of objects. We look forward to the next rotation to see how many of these mounts will be reused for the new display. One thing is certain is that they will all be kept in order to constitute a mount bank which can be adapted to the new object in similar format. This is a new project which is an opportunity to use the telescopic slide to present contemporary artworks. We also decided to use this system to present the artworks of the Montreal-based artist Karen Tam. This series of work are representations of traditional Chinese porcelain made of hand-painted papier-mâché. Some of these irregular and fragile objects are totally suitable for this wall mount system. Stone pools is one of the many papier mache plates that requires to be wall mounted. Here is some image of the test fit before the coating and padding, while the, the object is wrapped in a dartic layer. The artist Karen Tam chose to keep a natural brass finish for all the plate mounts. Here is an example on how changing the clip's folding could change the resistance of the slide. Final result will be an aesthetic and safe presentation of the work while allowing to adjust the positioning of those irregular objects with the telescopic clips. After having largely done its work, the telescopic slide mounting system is now our new standard for presenting light and fragile objects that lend themselves to it in a wall mount presentation. Thank you everyone for being there. Hope uh, this presentation will help you for your next install of light or fragile objects. Um, let me know if you have any question. We'll meet right now in the real world.
Anouk. Ça fait plaisir, Laura. Um, I'm sure we have some Q&A for that. Those are such beautiful mounts. They're just like, I'm totally stealing that idea of the clips with the little bump in it to like to do a tension fit. Stealing it. Yeah, I know. It's just because I'm letting you stealing it, Laura. Then that's just borrowing. That's not stealing. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, Pierre-Luc, I'm going to ask you some questions. Yeah, I'm ready, Sam. Ready? Okay, yeah. I'm going to go off camera. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about the solder and the torch that you were using? Oh, yes. Um, I unfor unfortunately have uh, only a big oxyacetylene torch uh, in my workshop. Um, so for very small soldering like this uh, with, um, with thin brass strips, uh, I use a tin and silver alloy, uh, which melt at a lower temperature. And uh, the, the torch that uh, I am using is um, some uh, polypropylene gas, or uh, in this case, I think in the video is uh, propane gas, which work well with, uh, with, this, um, with this kind of uh, welding. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about those clips, Pierre? Like, look how they sort of went in and out and how did you secure them? Um, and how did you make sure that they stayed in, intact and then how they're also um, secured to the daguerreotype? Yeah, um, with the daguerreotype, there is like four clips in the bottom. Uh, and um, I mean, uh, there is so much, uh, when, uh, when you move, like uh, I show in, this, in the last part, when you change the angle of folding uh, on the small bulb uh, at the bottom of the mount, um, this could make a very, uh, a very intense friction when you when you fit it in the brass uh, square brass rod. So it can be really hard to remove it after without damaging uh, the the mount itself or or the or the clip. So for a lightweight object like uh, like these or like all the, the the objects that you saw in this video, uh, it's totally impossible to you know, lay out of the mount. Fantastic, thank you. Um, someone's asking about the mirror and how you installed that mirror at the back of the daguerreotype. Oh yeah, that, um, I used a double face uh, polyethylene foam uh, to glue it on, uh, to stick it on the back uh, of the showcase. Um, and then after uh, the, the, the old was only, was, um, was drilled before the hole in the plexiglass, and after I just needed to, to drill the, the back of the showcase and then uh, install the, the small mount with a friction fit inside the, inside the showcase. Excellent, thank you. People are also asking about that Valara strip, like um, is that just off the shelf or is that something that you made? Oh no, uh, I buy uh, some uh, 132 uh, Valara rabbit tape, which is mostly used in framing um, I prefer that for very small mounts uh, than the felt because um, the the designer here, Marie France Grondin, and I doesn't doesn't like to to see a small um, small hairs around the object when uh, when you need to have some very thin strips. Yep, great. Also, Valara is very good against vibration on objects. Yep, fantastic. Um, there's a question here, Pierre Luc, about the display. How long will the displays last? Because someone's thinking about how, um, um, you know, that the spring systems are susceptible to entropy. Um, the, in that case, uh, the, this exhibition is, um, is installed for 10 years. And uh, the, the, the content of this showcase are related um, every year. But uh, now with the COVID crisis, the museum has been closed uh, for some several times and all the lightning in the gallery were shut down. So uh, we, uh, I think uh, there's already some people which are figuring out uh, at what time we'll do the next rotation. But uh, inside the showcase also an important element is that um, the, the lightning is uh, controlled by a movement sensor. 
So when there's no one in the gallery, the, the light is shutting down itself. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there's a question here about, was there any concern about visitors touching the objects? Oh yeah, <laughs> um, I think uh, in my video, I was so much focused on small works that um, I, I forgot to introduce uh, the, whole, uh, the whole display. Uh, so let me explain it. Um, all, all the objects are inside, uh, well mounted inside a showcase. And there's a, there's a large um, uh, glass in front of the um, in front of all the display. Excellent. Yeah, there was another question there about the security. So I guess you've you've pretty much covered that now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's another question here about just that confirmation about what did you use for the sliding part of your mount? Oh, it's all brass. Uh, uh, all these mounts are made of the bra of brass. It's one uh, one thirty two pier, one eight of a hinge uh, brass strips that slip into um, uh, if I can remember the. Uh, I think it's a quarter inch for, uh, by three thirty two. Uh, square tubings. Okay, thank you. Um, and I've got a question for you. Can you talk to us a little bit about were, were there any challenges with this type of mounting system? Like, did you? Can you talk to us about those challenges and then how you overcame them, or you know, a little bit more about sort of just that initial design and and how did you come up with this solution? I think would be great as well. Okay, um, the most challenging part were the daguerreotype, uh, how to safely handle them, and how to even how to how to make a, a safe positioning inside the uh, inside the display. So we didn't we didn't uh, play around with the objects to to define uh, the positioning of the showcase. We played only with the mounts. Uh, because uh, they are they are so fragile uh, that we can only let them close because um, the most of them has the original inch, which is absolutely weak and, and you can see through the inch. So the I think the the greatest challenge in that in the in that project was to uh, to manage how to handle the daguerreotypes uh, in a safe way. Absolutely. Um, and there's another question that's just come through saying, why did you use square brass instead instead of round? Uh, for the it's because of the the friction fit that I made with the the telescopic slide. Um, with with round one, uh, you know that the, the clips can can go around like this, and uh, you need to have a, a bigger tube uh, than than if you use a flat one. Um, also, um, I um, personally I hate padding round stock because uh, you, you need to use some tubing and I, I, it's always uh, making the mount uh, bigger each time I, I use tubing on it. And if we are using uh, uh, if we are using um, Volara or Polysuit, uh, uh, it's uh, it's always a bit tricky to uh, to install it on a round on a round shape. Great. Well, thank you. That that's all the questions that we have at the moment. But um, we can let people know that they do if they do have more questions, they can um, speak to you at the after party tonight, or yeah. they can actually contact you directly. Exactly. So, uh, so thank you, everyone, for being there. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you everybody. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed your first taste of IMF 2020. Um, during the break and between the sessions, we'll have Lucia Turner's poster up for view. Please add any questions to the Q&A. Um, she'll be available in the chat and the Q&A to answer any questions that you might have from 4.45 to 4.55. And then for those of you who have pre-registered, Tim Scornia's Mount Lab Tour at the St. Louis Art Museum in St. Louis, Missouri, USA, will start at 4.15 via the Zoom links that you've already received after you registered. So have a great break and see you back here soon. Mm -hmm.